If we do, let me know. Okay, yeah, I'm currently at Ernst & Young. I'm gonna talk about a company I was with about five years ago that I took from about 20 people to 200 when I was the director of engineering there. And I thought that this would be a little interesting talk because um, like a lot of startups, we were using rapid application frameworks like Ruby on Rails. And, but it turns out where the, the startup kind of pivoted to was really mission critical, the software turned out to be. So the, what I'll be talking about is how, how we handled buildings fast and loose, but keeping defects to a minimum. So as the levels of abstraction of our um, app development tools continue to like pile up, we can build ever more complex apps ever more quickly. And we can hire, we can build fast and hire fast and cheap, but and usually early stage startups prioritize that speed over quality. Get your MVP or latest feature up and in front of the market as soon as possible is a mantra. Bugs be damned and you can fix them when they get reported. And there are some exceptions, of course. A few years ago, I was at a conference and I was sitting with engineers from GitHub and I was wrestling with this uh, mission critical thing with my team. And I asked him about their test suite. And I was like, how, how fast does your test suite run? And they said something like, oh, the whole thing is runs in two and a half minutes. And of course I was like, what? And how I thought they must have like massive parallelization or something happening. And they just said, so I asked them about it and they were like, no, we just don't have to test that much. We don't run any browser tests. We write unit tests when, only when we need to. Our users are such good bug reporters that we get feedback really and very thoroughly about what's broken on GitHub. So we'll, we just deploy, deploy, deploy you know, several times a day. And if things break, we get feedback and fix it. And we have good infrastructure to roll things back as well. So that drove home a good point that that approaches to testing and really approaches to your whole organization, hiring, your org chart, your CI pipeline, the agile practices you follow should align with how mission critical your software is. Life and death should be a whole different organization than electric scooter rental. Although I've seen life and death situations in San Francisco with scooters on, techies on scooters zooming around. It's crazy down there. Let's see. So the software I'm going to talk about today was a financial company. It's called Renew Financial. It's in, it was a fintech startup. And it started out as a website built by a local a civil engineering firm to encourage Portland homeowners. And this is just a feel-good thing they did. They were put together a little team to encourage Portland homeowners to disconnect their gutter downspouts from the sewer system and let the water run into their yard because the sewer system here is, wasn't big enough to handle all the rainwater when it rains. So it was not a mission critical website we're building, but that happened to align with a startup that a guy was doing in Oakland, who was not a technical person at all. He was actually the chief of staff of the mayor of Berkeley. And he had an idea about how to finance putting solar panels and getting people to change their behavior for environmental reasons was the um, connection that made him buy this um, team in Portland and make it his tech team. So that team went from building that little motivational website to essentially backend banking software, managing financial loans, connecting consumers with a call center and tax assessors in like hundreds of municipalities around the country, uh, Wells Fargo, Citibank, and a Wall Street law firm managing like hundreds of millions in these bundled micro uh, municipal bonds. So it got, there were financial and legal requirements involved at every step. It was a kind of a mix of fast moving transactions, like millions of dollars every week and slow moving government entities that needed historical stuff and things filed. And so our eyes had to be dotted every step of the way. We had a reputation of being able to execute on these things because it was complicated. And so our CEO was able to go out and raise money and keep the thing going because of our tech team. So what I'm going to talk about are the changes we made in the transition from building a quick and dirty, not very mission critical MVP 
to like a lawyer laden loan processing backend banking system with Ruby on Rails, which was really designed for MVPs and not banking. On the dev side, it was pretty simple. It's just make sure you have as thorough co test coverage as is relatively easy to do. We erred on the side of over testing. Yeah. So we didn't leave any of these things to chance on the development side. And as far as the org chart goes, starting with a small team, it was pretty much operated like this. this these are the sort of the main influence was the dev team. There's about seven people and the devs really ran. The designer was totally reactionary to the dev request. Like I need some styling over here and make it look good. The DevOps was the surly guy off in the corner, just like keeping infrastructure running. And the product owner was largely like an administrative position in charge of the JIRA backlog and dragging things around, making sure the stories were written in the right format and tracking velocity and communicating the roadmap to the CTO. We had a non-technical CTO at this point who was in another city who barely ever showed up. That made my job actually really great but really important. And as long as we just delivered, he wouldn't show up. So our architect and senior devs would meet with the stakeholders, which were different entities, but mostly it was our internal team down in Port in Oakland, the business side. And, and they, the senior devs and architects would do the requirements gathering and hand it off to the product owner to write up. What happened next was that the complexity of the business requirements started to increase we, and we got lucky and had a couple of greenfield reset opportunities as the startup pivoted. And we decided for some reason at some point to create a new org. And it really was, I don't remember the meeting. I don't remember who decided it, but we did this kind of weird thing where we stuck QA engineers under the product team. And, and that made a huge difference. The product owner was a smart guy. Um, an NBA, not a programmer, but still a smart guy. And uh, no offense, Ian. No, you're both. So, yeah. And he had spent several years like tagging along with the dev manager and architect doing requirements gathering and working on features and epics for the backlog. So he was capable of taking that over. And he and eventually his whole team came to be able to actually write tests. Do people know what cucumber tests are? No, honey knows. Go to the last slide. The, this is a, a cucumber test. This is actually executable code. There's a format that you can write. <laughs> and so product owners can write practically in English and specify, in our case, we did golden path, no edge cases, tests like this. The developers come in and make this all work. So when this test runs, it opens up the browser and Selenium drives a browser to make the stuff happen and assert this. <clears throat> so our product team would actually write these. They would deliver stories with cucumber, cucumber tests attached before a development team even hit them. You can go back to slide five or six, actually. Another thing the product team did was they specified validations and data types that we were gonna use and suggested associations between ent business entities and that were very often directly reflected in our database schema and migrations we would write. And so you can imagine that if your product team understands all of that, that your stories are going to arrive for development being highly logically consistent. A lot of the churn that happens discussing between product owner and engineers or engineers and QA, if it makes it that far, about figuring out what this feature is actually supposed to do and how it's supposed to work, stopped happening because the product team was so on top of it. Also, you can see that the QA, the product was also in charge of all QA and acceptance. Uh, so the QA team had a completely separate code base from the actual apps, and their focus was solely on browser tests, full stack integration tests only, and they had a huge suite to test every little edge case. And so both the dev team and the QA team wrote separately for every story, and they'd only really talk to each other if something had to coordinate, if de the devs need, had to write something that would make it a little easier for the QA to test. And if something, having two teams look at every story and work on it, if something unclear, 
<laughs> and they would make different assumptions about how something is supposed to work. That would result in like a beneficial conflict early in the development process that have to be worked out before anyone did too much work. So this is great, all well and good. What did this do for the dev team? The responsibilities of the dev team really shrunk. And we were no longer going upstream and talking to people and thinking about big picture and everything. We could just focus on these logically consistent stories coming in and figuring out the best way to implement them. And we really focused on making our code maintainable and well-factored. And that resulted in a huge boost in productivity. They could, the development team within six months had gained a whole bunch of new skills on how to make complex code uh, more maintainable. Cool. Just to give you an idea of the sort of ratios and numbers, these are snapshots of the numbers when the headcount of, this is just the tech team for the company went from 12 to 26. And maybe the most interesting number might be the ratio of QA engineers to devs was about one to three. Let's see. And now I, I don't have any proof or metrics for you. You just have to trust me that this, we just didn't have bugs in our backlog. We had no process for prioritizing bugs or triaging them because they just didn't happen. Okay. Next slide. So to came time when the time came to grow, I was very careful and interested in keeping this really high quality code happening. And so hiring was a big deal and it turned out to be accurate. The, we had, we designed a really strict hiring process so that we did the exact same questions and the same process with every candidate so we could really compare them. And at this time, as 2013, 14, 15, our, the market for devs wasn't quite as tight as it was now. So we had a lot of applicants, although they were mostly junior. So I think still now you can get a lot of like code school grads, a lot of code school grads. Yeah. So we had a phone screen that very few people were filtered from, and then we gave a take home code challenge. And that was a really simple test it was like build a web app where you can upload a CSV and display the sum of one of the columns on the resulting page. And then we gave them business context for it. Like, here's the business that needs it. Here's why they need it. And if they didn't completely test everything, like our test practices, our own internal practices followed, then they were rejected. About 90% of the people who applied, and some of them were good engineers, knew, or I had a guess that they were good. But we stuck to our guns with our, with that process being strict with it. And because we, didn't want any false positives. We didn't want to hire a single person that was a bad fit. And, and we wanted, I wanted like people who were already 100% on board with our testing philosophy and, and showed that they had a good, a strong interest in writing like elegant code. So that ratio of, of hiring, it was about 50 interviews and stuff for five hires, about one out of every 10 would make it all the way through. And it was strange. I had to go to my CTO every time we were hiring someone and I would, they'd say, this person's never worked a tech job before. Some kid up in Boston somehow found us on Stack Overflow, applied, and he made it through this system. Our process looking great, like way better than everyone else. And, uh, and the salary for him starting was like 65K or something like, and, and he turned out to be really great. And it was an awesome deal. So that's what this process ended up with. And we ended up hiring maybe seven engineers just like that. And they integrated with the team and it was a really awesome, like productive team. Oh yeah. And one other thing about the company that I really emphasize with is, so our company mission was to like save the planet by reducing greenhouse gas output. And by putting up solar panels on as many houses as possible by providing cheap financing for them. And this kind of affected, like attracted idealistic people who are also idealistic about software. So I really cranked up the mission in the, from the very beginning of the hiring process, I emphasized that I wanted people who are really interested in that. And those people tend to be idealistic and want their software to be like very well considered by the time they hit the keys. So I ended up with managing, I had 14 direct reports who very needed very little. I got slide seven. Okay. So yeah, summary is 
design your workflow pipeline and best practices for the risk level of your software, up your pro product owner game. And this really was the biggest factor of all these things. Isolate QA from development. So you have two in engineering teams working on the same stuff and hire for risk level.